Welcome to the House of Agents podcast, where we teach you what real estate school didn't, interviewing incredible agents and real estate professionals from all across the world and highlighting what really matters to build a scalable and sustainable real estate business. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button, buckle in, because we have got an incredible episode for you today. Thank you so much for being here. And as always, thank you for being a part of the neighborhood. Welcome back, everyone. Today, we have Paige with us all the way from Utah. I must say, I'm sure it's warm there, but I am jealous because today it is 117 degrees out there in Arizona. So I'm feeling jealous of anywhere that's a little bit cooler than that. But thank you so much for jumping on and joining us here today. It's so happy to have you on. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited. We've met like at a few different events. I think we like cross paths on another podcast we did. And um, yeah, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, of course. So first, if you want to just give sort of like the cliff notes version of, you know, how you got into real estate, I especially love if there's sort of like, what was that tipping point that you said, okay, I want to do this as a career? What kind of got you excited about getting into real estate in the first place? So I actually worked as a personal stylist at Nordstrom when I was in college and it was really fun. I loved, like I built up kind of a clientele and they would just like call me if they needed outfits for a trip or they would have me get like a dressing room ready and come in and I would like send them new stuff as we got it in. And then I was getting close to graduating college and I was like, I'm not going to work at Nordstrom forever. What am I going to do? I didn't really know any real estate agents. My in-laws had uh, purchased a home at the time and my mother-in-law actually gave me the idea. She was like, have you ever thought about getting into real estate? Like they make good money and I think you'd be so good at it. And so then I was like, oh, it's kind of sparked the idea in me. And I called just a couple agents who I, who were like local agents who were doing a really good job and interviewed with them, just asked if I could meet with them and kind of talk about how real estate works, how they got into it, what's the best way to start. And this one lady, she was like, yeah, real estate is great, but nobody's going to use you. Like, especially when you're new, like, why would somebody use you over like someone like me who's been doing this for like 20 years? And you really don't know what you're doing. Even after school, you can go to school and get your license, but there's just a lot more that goes into it. It's not just this easy, you know, you get your real estate license and start selling a bunch of homes. Like it's going to be hard to get people to use you. And she actually gave me the, the advice. She was like, I would join a team. You can join a team that's doing a lot of business and get mentorship and they'll just give you deals and you can hit the ground running. You make less commission, but it's a great way to learn and and get started with clients right off the bat and have a built-in mentor. And so I called around to some different brokerages, found a team that was hiring. I ended up um, getting connected with this one guy who only had one buyer's agent and she was moving. And so he needed somebody new. And I was like, this is perfect because I had seen some of the other teams and they have a ton of agents and I was thought I would get a little bit lost in there and didn't want to be fighting for deals. And so I joined Keller Williams, did all their training, joined this guy's team, like before I even was finished with my license and he started giving me deals. He did the Zillow thing and then he'd give me his own deals, basically all the buyers. And I just learned really quickly and hit the ground running and it was really fun. And then once I had started having kids, I kind of, uh, felt like I knew what I was doing at that point. It had been a year or two. I had done a ton of deals. And so I decided to stay, take a step back a little bit. I hung my license under this guy. It was just a local guy here. He charged me like 500 bucks per deal. I figured I'm just going to be doing this on the side for a while. while I have little kids. And so it was great. But then, um, as my kids started getting older, I had some help. I wanted to get back into it more and more and really build my own thing. And so I joined a better brokerage and, um, kind of went all in and, um, started doing social media that kind of took off. And now I'm like, dang, this has turned into like, you know, I'm, I'm super happy. Now I have, I'm not like constantly worried about when my next deal is coming from. I'm like in working every day. I have my own team and been really fun. So there you go. There's my whole life story in like two minutes or however long that was. I love it. I love it. No, there's a lot of great things in there. You know, I love that you mentioned that you started out going and joining a team. I now all the time when I get questions from new agents, they're like, how should I get started? 
I'm like, that is the best way to do it. And I was a little hard headed 18 year old. And I was like, no, I, I'll figure it out myself. And I think that I really shot myself in the foot getting started without having like, you know, a team or someone I could learn from because you really learn so much. I mean, real estate as a whole, you learn so much by doing, but if you can already like speed up the process a little bit by taking some of the knowledge from someone who's already been in it, I feel like that just shortcuts the process like tenfold. Yes. A hundred percent. So how did you start getting your first deals? Like you just started calling people or door knocking or how did you start out not being on a team? I did a little bit of everything. I actually started um, flipping houses, so I was not licensed yet. I like loved the idea of flipping houses. And so I got into it on that side. And as I was doing some of my own flips, those became some of my first listings once I did get licensed. And then I was like, I think there's something here. Um, and I like kind of hit the social media wave perfectly. So I was documenting my flips on social media. And, uh, you know, those became really great lead gen tools for both like attracting agents and attracting new clients. And so it just kind of, uh, I mean, I think with a lot of stuff, once you catch that momentum, it just kind of took off like what felt like overnight, but it was really a couple years of just like showing everything and kind of flopping my way through it. Yeah. Um, but those first deals came mostly from like leveraging what I had from my own investments Got it. and trying to, you know, get more through that. So it worked, but I think that I, uh, I think that I skipped a lot of steps and I probably could have been more successful early on if I had just gotten some, some mentorship or coaching of some sort. Yeah. It's a great way to learn. You have somebody who's invested in you succeeding. They want you to do a really good job. So they teach you ex exactly how to give really high level service because they're clients, like they want to make sure they're being taken care of. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think either somebody has to have some sort of way to start, whether you have flips that you can start listing or because even like family members, it's, they're like, okay, I'm a brand new agent. Like, even if you have really close friends who are buying, I imagine it would make people nervous when you've yeah. never done a deal before. I had a couple of really cool family members. One of my cousins, Cameron Kimball, shout out, shout out to Cameron, gave me a, one of my first deals actually being on the team. He was like, Hey, I need to buy a house. Like, this is my budget. Go find me something. I was like, oh my gosh, I was so nervous. I have to do such a good job. I have to make sure it's a really good buy, run all the numbers. And I found him, um, sent him a couple properties. And he's like, yeah, that one, he bought it. And um, anyways, I was so excited, like so <laughs> thrilled that he would trust me. And now, you know, the more people see you doing it, the more experience you've had, the longer you've been in it, people just trust you. And they're like, oh yeah, I know she's got it. And she's got this figured out and she's going to take great care of me, you know? Yeah. Special shout out to all those friends and family members that trust you with an early deal when they maybe shouldn't have, because you're still like not exactly. entirely sure what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think everyone has one of those early people that trust them as they're still trying to get their feet beneath them. But they're, they're that's the really best. the way you learn. Yeah. Yes. Your ride or dies that are just like, all right, here you go. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. Just like let you do it when you're just completely figuring it out. And yeah. Well, and the reality know? is I would like to believe that you probably do some of your best work on those deals because you have so much to lose. You're like, well, if I screwed this deal up, I could not only lose a deal, but also like a friendship or have hard challenges oh, with yeah. a family member. So you put everything into making sure that that's going to go just as it should and make sure nothing can go wrong. Oh, a hundred percent. I still get kind of nervous sometimes working with family yeah. Or friends. It's like, you want to make sure everybody's happy. And like, cause sometimes you can't control what happens in a deal. Like if the buyer just cancels or like something blows up with the loan. So anyways, yeah. that still makes me a little bit nervous, but at least now I have the confidence that like I can do everything on my end. You know? Yeah. You can put out all the fires. You've done it before. There's not too much that can scare you when you're seasoned in real estate. You're like even the most off the wall situation. I feel like I've handled the crazier things. So yes, it definitely exactly. prepares you for everything. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. I know that your business has grown quite a bit and you have some team members and all of this kind of stuff. I think you even just made a big move to real. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm Congrats. so excited. Yeah, Thank that's you. really exciting. Well, yeah. so what is one of, if you had to pinpoint one thing that you think has been one of the largest contributors to uh, your business, like one thing that you started doing more of to see more success in your business, what do you think that one thing would be? Well, social media for me has been huge. I think I was doing, I was okay. Like I was doing, um, like 10, 15 million a year. But when I started going all in on social media, it helped things really blow up and get to the point where I needed to add, bring on team members. I couldn't handle everybody. 
and particularly listing videos. So I started uh, when Reels became a thing. At the time, there wasn't every agent on Instagram doing real estate Reels. Nobody was really doing Reels that were real estate related at the time. And so I was taking some of these trending audios or just funny little ideas and um, just taking this stuff that was trending and making it have to do with real estate. And I would do little tips on how, how much you have to put down on a $500,000, $600,000, $7,000 house, how much you need to put down on a home period, how to house hack, like just helpful tips that people who aren't in real estate, it seems simple, but most people, you know, they either never bought a home before or they haven't bought one in years. And so just little things that were helpful and just stay top of mind with my SOI. Um, and that was the first thing I started noticing. I made a little real estate Instagram account. I was putting out helpful tips, funny videos, um, and I really saw people come out of the woodworks that I maybe wasn't following up with as much or I hadn't talked to in a while. I feel like they were almost like, oh, she's trying so hard. Like she's, <laughs> she's giving us valuable information. She's putting in so much work. We're going to throw her a deal. Like I was staying top of mind with people. They wanted to like help me out because I was putting so much effort in. And then um, it really turned into, uh, so I, I started out just doing real estate educational videos. And then once I started getting better and better listings, um, I really went all in on listing videos in particular. And that's, I feel like a lot of my social media now, I still try to do helpful stuff to keep people around. I don't want it to be all houses, but I actually saw, do you know Tim Smith out in Orange County? Um, the name sounds familiar, but I can't picture him. So a friend of mine sent me this listing video he did. He remade the song, Teach Me How to Dougie. Oh, okay. Yes. I do remember that video. Yes. So she sent me this. I'm like, what? This is amazing. I want to do this. That's so fun. Like I'm going to start doing that when I get good listings. And so I got a, a good listing. I did this really fun video for it and, um, people loved it. I got another listing from it. And so now I kind of go on, on these listing videos. I kind of have them dialed where I make them short, like a minute or less, some sort of hook, just really dynamic and to keep people's attention, just highlighting the best features of the house. And uh, I boost them as ads on different social media platforms. And then now we really funnel people to our CRM from them. So if they, we use many chat so they can comment a word, they get the property website sent to their mm -hmm. inbox with like the Matterport tour, the floor plan, all of the marketing, and then a little Google sign on pops up. And then we just funnel them all to our CRM where we categorize people and can remarket to them. Yeah. And so listing videos have been, I'd say now first social media, now listing videos in particular have been the one thing that has been great for my business because the sellers yeah. love it. You're getting them more exposure for your house. You're like, Oh, I'm running this as an ad. I paid this money to make this amazing listing video. Everybody's going to know about it. More people see the listing video and they want one for their house. They see how good of a job you're doing. And it's just kind of a snowball effect. So it's been yeah. awesome for me. Yeah, that's awesome. And so I know you mentioned like when you were starting out before you had the cool listings to go make these videos with, you were doing a lot more like the educational type stuff, which I think that's where a lot of agents, you know, start out or they are always including kind of the educational stuff. Um, and it's so funny that you said they, they kind of threw you a bone when I was starting out with real estate and it was like Facebook live was kind of popular at the time. And so I was petrified to get on a video, but I was like, I'm going to do a 30 day Facebook live challenge. Cause I figure I've always sort of been a, you know, jump off the deep end kind of person. And so I was like, yeah. I'll just go live every day for 30 days and talk about something real estate related. And I did that and I got like seven deals out of that. And most of the people that came from that were people that were like, honestly, I just loved your consistency of like every day you were on live. Yeah. And so I think that the content matters, but more than anything, like that's one of the pieces with social media is it, it helps you to show up even long after you've done it. Like a live was obviously short term because it wasn't staying around forever. But with our social media stuff, you know, you can post a video and it gets, you know, some decent engagement in the beginning, but it can, it lasts forever. People can go and rewatch that. Sometimes they randomly get another little boost of engagement out of nowhere. And it's really cool to just have that always sort of working in the background to continue driving traffic for you. People appreciate effort and yes. the, it just helps you stay top of mind. Like when they're seeing, even if they're just scrolling past, they see your stuff, it's still going to like in their subconscious, like, Oh, Utah real estate page. Like it's still going to like, they're going to associate you with real estate and your business and what you're doing. Even if they don't really care, or they're just scrolling past it. You're going to stay top of mind with people. And then there's the people who are like, wow, she's trying really hard. You know, we should give her a yeah. deal 
or they're just going to think of you when their friends selling a house, like, Oh, I always see Paige on here talking about real estate, you know? Yeah. So it helps keep you top of mind. People appreciate effort, especially if you're adding value and giving them tips or some sort of helpful information. I feel like they want to give back to you, you know? That's so true. Yeah. So that was one thing that you kind of started doing more of the social media, especially the videos. Was there anything that you feel like you stopped doing in your business that resulted in like increased production or just feeling like you had a better grasp on, on your business as a whole? Um, honestly, nothing I can think of. I feel like I'm constantly trying to do more and more. Um, I have stopped doing as many little fun educational videos, but it's only because I'm so busy now with business that I'm like, by the time I film all these listing videos, I just have enough time for like We do a monthly edit where it's just like information, local information that I'm like, Hey, if I was living in Utah, what would I want to see? Like fun places to go. What are the best things to do in the spring? The best restaurants to go visit. So we still do a monthly edit for like, I'll give local tips and things, but I feel like I don't have as much time to, do the educational reels or the content that's just like, just because adding value. So I would like to start time blocking that in and being like, okay, I just want to make some videos that are pure value, kind of fun, entertaining because people really liked those and they don't only want to see listing videos. Some people really like it. They like looking at cool houses and they like seeing what's for sale. But I think you have to have a few different types of content on your page. I try to cycle through when I was really on top of it, I would try to cycle through like a real estate educational post a cool house that's for sale, uh, cool tips and tricks are like local information. So people have multiple reasons to follow you and you get different demographics. Some people might follow you for like the best restaurants to go to or what's going on in your area. And that's your target audience. Like people that are in your local area, that's your ideal clientele. Obviously some people might want to see cool houses and then you definitely want to show your personality with like some fun, um, you know, just some fun videos that are entertaining, but real estate tips, local tips, cool houses, and then just like some fun videos to show your personality every once in a while. And I've gotten probably a little heavy on listing videos, but it's just because I'm like, I've got to find the time now to like mix in the other stuff as much as I used to. Well, it's also not a bad problem to have, to have so many listing videos. You know, you're like, that's one that I'll, I'll take that problem out of any problems yes, for the time yeah. being. <laughs> I'd rather have that than not having any that I can That's do, very you know? true. Yeah. So, um, with your team, how many, how many agents do you have working with you right now? So I have one girl that's on salary and then I have two buyer's agents. Okay. So, and when and they then, joined your team, were they brand new agents or how did that kind of come to be? How did you find these people to align with you and work with you? So the first, I kind of did it backwards. I know like the Gary million dollar real estate agent, I think is the book where Gary Keller like lays out the best way to yeah. start a team. And everyone will tell you, you need to hire somebody on salary first, like an admin transaction coordinator and get everything dialed and then bring on buyer's agents if needed. I was just, I'm a creative. Like if you can't tell, I love the creative side of things. I love coming up with fun ideas. I love being out and talking to people, like sitting down and doing a spreadsheet or like basically <laughs> anything like organizational is just like not my brain type. I'm just like, I would rather throw up. But um, I got to the point where I had so much business. I'm like, gosh, I'm starting to like, I feel like I can't give the right level of service that I want to give to all these people. I need help. I don't have time to be showing homes every day when I have 10 million other things to do. And so I asked my broker, I'm like, do you have anyone you think would be good for like a buyer's agent? Like that's how I started. And, um, in my mind, I have like imposter syndrome. I'm like, Oh, no, one's going to want to, I like, I started on a team and it was great, but I'm like, I feel bad. Like, I don't know Would anybody want to come like have some of these buyers and help me. And so she introduced me to my first buyer's agent. I just basically added her on. I'm like, here you go. Here's a bunch of buyers <laughs> do this, this, and this like, good luck. I need help showing homes. And there was, it was chaos, but luckily she did a really good job and we worked together with them. Like we would be, both be on a group thread. We'd do the buyer consult together. She'd help show the homes. And then she was kind of newer. So then I'd help her, you know, with stuff along the way. Um, and then I, once that started growing more and more, cause it's always scary adding somebody on salary that you're paying. Cause you're like, like, Oh my gosh, what if nobody ever buys or sells a house for me again? <laughs> like, what if this all stops? And then I have somebody relying on me for money. Like I like put that off until the very end when I was just desperate. Like I hired a TC for a while. I was just paying her, you know, to do all the paperwork, but then finally mm -hmm. I got to the point. I'm like, Hey, I need help. Like I've got to bring somebody on. So I had my first hire on salary and I was like, I just need you to go in and make sure everything is dialed. Nothing gets missed. Everything's organized, like stay up to date on the deals that are under contract listings or buyers. 
And so it's been super helpful. And now I'm to the point where I kind of want to get another one, but again, I'm nervous. I'm like, oh, what if things don't stay as good? What if I don't keep growing? So anyways, buyer's agent, admin on salary, then another buyer's agent. And um, now I'm kind of thinking of doing a second hire, but we'll see. Yeah. What do you I know, do? It's do you always, assistants and stuff? Like you? Yeah. And it's always scary when you do have somebody's income and they're reliant on you, you know, even if things are great and you're like, I could pay you five times over this month and it'd be no worries. It's yeah. still this pressure, you know, of somebody else relying on you. And also I think the workload stuff, I personally have a hard time sometimes like handing tasks off fully. I've gotten much better at it over the years, but uh, I definitely tend to be that person that's like, oh, well, I could just do it real quick instead of and fully delegating it, it and like accepting that maybe my way isn't the only or best way. And that if somebody does it a different way, that's totally fine. <laughs> yeah, I know. I always think like, I've been doing this for 10 years. Like I can obviously do it the best and I'm not the best at sitting down and taking the time to go over everything in so much detail but it's been a learning curve and it's been good and super helpful to have somebody. So yeah. Anyways. Yeah. yeah no, that's definitely a part of the process. Well, yeah. so if you had a new agent come up to you, you know, who was really setting their sights on, let's say a hundred thousand dollar year, they wanted to have their first hundred thousand dollar year. They're trying to hit the ground running. What would be like three main non-negotiables that you would tell a new agent as like, Hey, if you focus on these three things, you will be right on the right track to achieving that. Um, well, the biggest thing is conversations. Like I, every conversation I have almost, I bring up real estate somehow. Like I was on a listing appointment yesterday. I brought this agent on. She's going to um, help me out with it and be on as co-agent. She came over to real. She's not officially on the team, but um, she's trying to do more deals. I was like, come, you can come help with this listing. I'll need help with it. And we stopped at the gas station just to get a drink on the way home. And like somebody was in line and I'm just started talking. I'm like, Oh, are you guys from here? Like, how long have you lived here? How do you, how do you like this area? Because it was a little bit outside of our area and just struck up a conversation with her. And I was like, yeah, we're agents. We're listing a house over here. And like, what are some of your best, you know, your favorite things about this area? And so she's just talking to us. And anyways, then she's asking about us and our business. I feel like everyone I talk to, I find some way to bring up real estate, not in a cringy way. Like I never do the, make calls and hi, who do you know that like wants yeah. to buy or sell real estate or that's interested? I never want to do that, but I'll drive by one of my client's house and be like, Oh, your house looks so cute. Like, how are you? Are you lo loving it? Or, you know, what are you liking about the area? That kind of thing. What's new with you guys? Just keeping up to date on people, making sure you make real estate a part of your conversation every single day. I'd say at least like 25 different people you should be talking to whether it's a text or a call or at the grocery store or when you're out and about, like find a way to talk about what you're doing because um, that's the best way to generate deals. I've, I've door knocked and stuff before, but for me, it's just like trying to talk about it in a non cringy way as much as possible. And then social media is such a powerful tool. A lot of agents are doing it now, but just as much value as you can add to your target audience, whether it's tips about your local area or real estate tips, the more value you can add. I mean, you can talk to 25 people during the day, but then one video can get you in front of 5,000 people. So obviously it's not always going to be your exact target audience, but that really adds up over time and helps just kind of uh, establish you as the professional. That's what you do. People associate that with you. So I think just conversations every single day and then adding value on social media are the two biggest things for yeah. me. Yeah. I love that you said that there's two things I really pulled out of that. Number one on the conversations, I think like probably one of the most valuable things that I think anyone can do, but especially in real estate is how to confidently bring up real estate in a conversation and just confidently talk to people and like ingrain what you do and really treat real estate as your, like a part of your life now, rather than just a job that you do. You're not really ever clocking in and clocking out of real estate because the reality is you can always be having a conversation about it. A hundred percent. And actually another thing I did when I really went back all in is like, I used to love listening to murder podcasts or like just <laughs> little, I still like them, but I'm like, Hey, what is this bringing it to me? I kind of believe in like what you put out into the universe comes back to you. I'm like, I'm, what am I doing? Listening to this murder podcast when I'm on a drive, <laughs> like I'm going to bring some murder in my life. Now with my social media presence, that's the last thing I need. I've already had some sketchy situations but I started listening to real estate podcasts, reading real estate books, like filling your mind with that kind of stuff. And then you have stuff to talk about, like something mm -hmm. that's helpful, stay updated on the rates, 
what's happening, what housing prices are doing, days on market in your area. People are interested in that and they want to know. So the more that you're intaking and um, the more knowledge you have, you can just be the professional and the person that people go to when they have a question and they just know that you know what you're doing and you're the professional. So definitely intaking a lot of that information and making sure that you're up to date on what's happening in the market. So you have stuff to talk about and share when it comes up. I love that. And it can be such a small thing. Like you said, putting on a podcast while you're driving to other things or like, you know, while you're getting ready in the morning, just tuning into like little bits and, and pieces that you will be able to go and bring up in conversation and actually use in your in your practice every single day. Yeah, exactly. I love that. It was super well, the helpful. second thing that I, I noticed that you said in there too, as in regards to social media was target audience, which I noticed because I know you specifically focus on that, but I think a lot of people overlook how important it is to like have an idea of a target audience. And I, I know this because I have so many agents that have pushed back on it before when I've said, oh, you know, you should have like a niche and an area that you're kind of trying to focus in on. They're like, yeah, but I can help everyone buy or sell a house. And it's like, well, yeah, so can every other real estate agent in your market. So having somebody who you're like a little bit more specifically speaking to is huge. Have you found that to be really helpful with like your social media strategy? It's just having more of like an idea of who you're trying to actually attract with what you're putting out there. A hundred percent. I always think about like some of my best clients, like they're going to see this. What are they going to think? Like if I was trying to reach those people or appeal to that demographic, like what are they going to think about this post that I'm posting? Are they going to find it helpful? Are they going to be impressed by it? Are they going to think it's professional? Um, so I think definitely remembering that it's not about you. It's about helping other people. And I think there's, I get comments sometimes people are like, oh, your reels just go viral. You're like this blonde and whatever with, you know that kind of thing. <laughs> and, um, I'm like, no, what matters is the value that you're putting out. And yeah, it's important to look good. Like I mm -hmm. actually love Dion Sanders. My cousin coaches with Dion Sanders out in Colorado. And he has this big thing in his office. It says, look good, feel good, feel good, play good, play good. They pay good. So it's like, yeah, you want to look your best and like be confident, but it's really about the content that you're putting out and you can't make it too much about you. Like sometimes some of these girls that it's like all about them. It's like my, my target audience is like middle-aged women. Like they're going to not want to work with some lady who's like trying to be, you know, just over the top, like all about yeah. myself. Like they want to know that I'm going to do a really good job for them. I'm going to be professional. I'm going to have their back. And so, yeah, I always have my target audience in mind when I'm yeah. putting this stuff out. And sometimes I do get a little bit on the edge because I, I like to show my personality. I like to do stuff that's fun or funny. So I'm like, it's not going to appeal to everybody, but you want to work with the people that get you anyways, but at least definitely keeping it in mind, like your clientele, who do you want to call you? What are they going to think about this content? Are they going to find it helpful? Are they going to find it professional? That kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally agree. And I find it makes it easier to create the content too. Cause if I am sitting there, sitting down to film something and I'm picturing almost just like talking almost on a FaceTime to that ideal audience instead of like, oh, who, what do I need to say? What script am I following? It kind of makes it flow in a more organic way. And it just makes that whole content creation process typically feel a lot smoother. Totally. I love that. I've done that before too. Like when you hop on stories or you're doing a talking post, you're holding your phone. Sometimes you feel so dumb. Like I am literally <laughs> talking to myself right now, like an idiot, yeah. <laughs> but just pretending like you're on a FaceTime, like I'll picture my sister sometimes. Like if I was just calling my sister right now, how would I be talking to her on FaceTime when you get in that funk where you're like not feeling it? Yeah. And it's super helpful. Yeah, it does help to kind of calm the nerves and just act like it's one of your friends on the other line and you're just totally comfortable. I love yeah, that. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I have my last, my final kind of hard hitting question for you, okay. which is, um, I am curious, what is your number one, like hot take or unpopular opinion, either about the real estate industry or just how you do things? What is like kind of a controversial hot take that you have? Um, gosh, I should have had this question before so I can think about it. But the first <laughs> thing that comes to mind is, um, the NAR settlement. Like I thought that made sense from the beginning. I yeah. always helped out clients. You have these old school agents who are like, Nope, it's 6%. No matter what, if they don't have an agent, I'm keeping the full 6%. I'm like, why would the seller be forced to pay you the full 6% if like the buyer doesn't have an agent? Like maybe it's somebody who had their license or who's licensed in another state. And they're like, no, I want to represent myself. Like I don't need an agent on the buyer side. 
I think it's super helpful to have an agent on the buyer side, obviously, like, especially for us, we're selling homes off market all the time. So we have access to yeah. off market deals, stuff that's upcoming, obviously expires or listings that, that never sold or just pocket listings that we have. So for us, our value add to buyers is we can get you access to everything. We can get you deals that are off market. We can protect your earnest money. Like we just saved $40,000 of earnest money just the other day. If the buyer wouldn't have had an agent, they would have been, it was a disaster. They, it's a long story, but the appraisal came in low <laughs> and we got this extension. They were trying to like make their earnest money non-refundable. Like it's super helpful in protecting your money, getting you a good deal. But there's some people who are just super dialed in. They know what they're doing and they don't need an agent. Maybe they used to be an agent and their mom's an agent in another state. And it's like, why should the seller have to pay the full 6% to the agent? It may, it makes more sense to me that they would pay two separate. Like they can offer the buyer's broker their fee, and then they can offer the listing agent their fee. If the listing agent brings the buyer, then sure, they can have both if it's one of your buyers that they're working with. But like, it's like, why were they ever forced to pay the full six? That doesn't really yeah. make sense. So everybody's up in arms about it. But I'm like, it's always <laughs> that is a good hot me. take because people are definitely debating about it. I even I threw up like a Facebook status post the other day about I don't know why I just said Facebook status. I don't think that's a thing at all in <laughs> Facebook post. <laughs> yeah, a Facebook post about that and the like comments were just insane and people arguing with each other and stuff. It really is kind of wild, but I think it's, I, I agree with you on that. And I think it's sort of the start of, I always, I always find it interesting that the real estate industry is one of those professions, unlike many others that doesn't have a lot of sort of like standard expectations. Like if you look at doctors, you know, they are going through extensive schooling and then shadowing and then training and then continuing to update all these things. And like, there's very set processes on how you engage a client and then operate on them or whatever, you know, and then in real estate, it's like, you can go take a class or classes in pretty much a week for some people take a test. And then all of a sudden you're out there servicing whoever. So it's I think it's so the start awesome. of more standardization. And like, I think that's really necessary. After I got my license, I was shocked. I'm like, wait, I can go help somebody <laughs> sell a $5 million house now. Like nobody is, nobody is helping me. Like nobody is here. Like, I don't know what the heck I'm doing. I could have majorly screwed somebody over, you know, yeah, it's, I know. Crazy it's crazy that crazy. Yeah, there's not more training or like force. You have to do a certain amount of deals with like underneath somebody first, yeah. that's like helping you. So yeah. Yeah, it is pretty wild. Well, where can our listeners find you, connect with you? What's the best place to find you online? Um, my handle across all social media is at Utah Real Estate Page on TikTok, YouTube, Instagram. I'm mostly on Instagram. I just like Instagram the best. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's where you can find me. Awesome. Well, we will also add the link for that down in the show notes. So it is easy to click and find Paige and connect with her. Let you know, let her know that you heard her here on this episode. Thank you so much for jumping on with us. I really appreciate it. And yeah, we'll talk thank to you, you guys next time. Bye.